Um, thanks, everybody, for being here um, this evening. My name is Jonathan Kleiman. I'm the president of Iqueous. Um, the mission of our company is to amplify the positive impacts that water and energy utilities are having on their communities. And there's a couple of key assumptions in there that um, shouldn't go unchallenged, I think. Um, the first is that utilities have positive effects or positive impacts on their communities. Um, and we believe that as stewards, effectively stewards of our natural resources, that utilities do in fact play a critical role in um, our natural resource management and the reliance that we have on these resources for society. Um, the second is that the sustainability and the amplitude of those positive effects is a public benefit. And there are a number of private entities, private sector companies, that might disagree that the utilities are the right entity um, to carry things forward, given the availability of more distributed energy resources and even more distributed water resources. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that the utility is a construct that we've made. It's a regulatory construct. Um, they didn't necessarily choose that. Um, I had drinks with the executive director of the Association of Energy Service Professionals um, two nights ago, and he said that, um, you know, tell somebody that the business that they can be in has a 10% upside and an infinite downside, and tell them exactly how excited they would be about that business. So utilities are in a difficult situation as partly of our own creation. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about this thing called the death spiral that people seem to believe that um, they're in right now. Uh, one more word about us is that um, <clears throat> Iqueous is more about the IOP than the IOT. So we're about the Internet of People and not necessarily about the Internet of Things. And so what we focus on is the data associated with people, their actions, their choices, their behaviors, and also the way that utility works with them. And so we help make those interactions visible and then create data out of it so the utility can understand what's going on with their community members. And so we'll talk about that as we discuss why I think that that aspect of things is so important. All right. Okay. Ah, there we go. All right. Overview. Uh, I know that you can all take a look at this while I'm talking, and I don't want to read it to you. Um, but the point is to spend a little bit of time talking about what a death spiral is, just to get everyone in touch with their mortality, as Matt was describing earlier, um, before we start talking about how is it the utilities right now seem to be caught in a death spiral, and are they really, and what are the different ways that they can get out of it. So the, um, what's going on in today's market, and this is true for both water and energy utilities, and somebody who phoned me was surprised to hear that water utilities were in the same situation, and I can assure you that they are. So sales are going down. We as societies and products are becoming more efficient in the use of resources, whether it's water or whether it's energy. Um, we're also starting to look at alternative sources of production of these resources. So whether that is photovoltaics or rainwater harvesting, you, you have people who are coming up with their own distributed supplies of these resources. The fixed cost for the utilities to provide a reliable service at a reasonable rate remain intact. They have to maintain the infrastructure. We count on them today to be there in case our PV system goes down or our rainwater harvesting system stops working or it hasn't rained and we don't have any water. And so um, they still have to maintain those costs for reliability, for public health, and especially on the water side, you've got increasingly stringent environmental uh, requirements and they have to invest more heavily in capital. So as a result, utilities have to increase the per unit cost just to be able to make ends meet. And what that does is, um, well, and the cost of the alternatives are starting to go down. So people are starting to do more solar. They're starting to do more distributed energy resources. Energy efficiency is becoming more prevalent. The Nest thermostat is now in the home. And so you've got um, competition for the traditional utility service. So what happens is customers start looking for cheaper alternatives to the resource, or they just want to be, quote, off the grid, unquote. They want to be more independent. They want to be able to produce their own resource. <clears throat> when utility sales hit, they have to increase the per unit cost. That in turn drives that price comparison and makes the utility look even more unfavorable. And so the logic is that that is going to cause this spiral 
to the point where financially the utility implodes. That's what the death spiral is, or that's the commonly conceived of notion of a death spiral. So, um, so I want to take a step back, <laughs> all right? So this was a really cool article in The Atlantic because um, the utility market is not the only market that's being described as being in a death spiral. Insurance is being described as being in a death spiral right now. So um, this guy from The Atlantic said, where did this term come from and why are people using it all of a sudden? And so, um, so it's a really fascinating read. So the death spiral occurred before pilots, before it was commonplace for pilots to trust the instrumentation. And they were relying upon their own body, their internal gyroscope, to be able to pilot the craft. And what happened was, when you lose sight of the horizon, you're in a fog bank, you're in a cloud, when you are turning, you, your body, because of the inner ears and equilibrium, you have no idea whether you're turning or whether you are um, actually going down. And so your body starts believing that what's happening is one thing and reality is another. And that's actually what creates a death spiral, leading to the demise of the craft. You know, you actually hit ground and that's when you discover that that's what was going on. So, so when, a, when a plane enters a turn and it causes it to send and pick up speed, the pilot only feels the descent and not the turn. So um, the way that um, the industry dealt with this <clears throat> is that they created instrumentation, especially something that allowed you to tell whether the plane was level <clears throat> and how close you were to ground. Um, interestingly, it took longer to get pilots to trust the instruments than it took to actually develop the instrumentation. Um, what we take for granted now on flights that we do all the time was a significant change management exercise over a decade or two, starting in about the 30s. So um, the new train of thought was check your instruments and believe the instruments and not your body. And you almost had to have a new generation of pilots um, coming online to be able to um, fly safely in these, um, in these situations. All right, so um, if this, so I, was just, so I was just curious about how do you take this metaphor and apply it to the utility death spiral? Um, and so the, the argument was, so logic that seems intuitive needs to be calibrated against reality. And if you talk about the utility death spiral, there's two intuitive senses of logic that you might have. The first is that sales are always going to go up, right? That the utility was built around the assumption that sales would continue to grow because population would continue to grow. And so you would always be able to sell more product and to be able to keep maintaining your fixed cost. And so, um, and so that logic seemed intuitive, and it's not intuitive anymore. Alternative supplies and technologies have come up on, online. The other logic that seems intuitive may be the fact that they're heading for the, the death spiral. I mean, it, it seems because you have to think about the assumptions that we made. We told the story, right? The story was um, customers seek alternatives, um, and they are successful. Utilities raise rates which means that they are less cost competitive. And we automatically assume that more customers seek the alternative. I mean, that's a, logic, that's a logical jump. Not everybody is necessarily going to do that. Um, we may not see 85% market saturation of photovoltaic systems. We might not. Or if that happens, then somebody's going to have to step in and actually manage the process. We may get blockchain energy markets. but I, I mean, that's a, that's a record in a registry, um, but I don't know if the blockchain is actually going to be able to force the electrons to go from one specific place to another. So we don't know. And because we don't know, um, it may be a fallacy to assume that the utility is automatically heading for this death spiral. They may, there may be some point at which they pull out. And so that's the point of this conversation. So the, the trick is, if you want to use this metaphor, right, how does the utility know what level flight is? How do they know that they are still horizontal, and how do they know what ground is? Like, where's ground? Where am I going to hit? How do I land on that instead of crashing into it? So if you take this metaphor, you have to figure out what that's going to be. So, so I think, I mean, if level flight refers to constant heading and altitude, then level flight, it means 
what are your financial resource requirements? Like, how are we going to run this organization in a fiscally sound manner? I've heard people describe utilities as being mostly financial and capital entities and not necessarily technical ones, meaning that they're capable of mobilizing large capital on a grand scale to be able to provide a resource at scale and a great economy. Um, they're not good with smaller ones, and they're not good with unstable or highly fluctuating um, financial situations. So they are a financial institution. And so their lifeblood is, are we going to be able to maintain a good financial um, basis? So a calibrated one means that you know, we're meeting our needs. Key question is, are they taking into account what's happening, what's changing in the market, and do they have the ability to respond? So you know, an uncalibrated situation means that um, maybe they haven't defined the requirements appropriately. Have they strategically defined what it is that they're trying to shoot for? That's, that may be the first gap, is that they haven't made that pivot to figure out what is the future state that we're looking for. So there's no way for them to tell whether or not they're level. So the second one is what's ground? Where, where are we going to run out of room? You know, how are we going to hit it? And so you know, it could be an unsustainable financial performance. You could have a loss of reliability, system reliability, customer dissatisfaction. So they relate to one another, right? If you run your organization in an unsustainably sound financial manner for some time, you'll hit ground. You know, it's going to leak. If you're first energy and you weren't tree trimming, you'll have a blackout that affects the entire eastern half of the U.S. Um, it just, it depends, right? It depends upon what the situation is. So, um, so is it possible for the utilities to get out of the death spiral? If you think about this, they need instrumentation, right? They need to be, first of all, they need to know, they need to define for themselves what's level flight, what is the appropriate financial path that we're on, and then they need good information. They need the instrumentation. So what should they be looking for? I think that they should be looking for sales, but it's not just sales of their product. They need to understand how much product is being consumed in the market. And that means understanding what's being provided by efficiency, what's being provided by solar, what's being provided by all these customer cited resources. They need to be able to have better data on what's happening in the market in en masse. Um, if we're not becoming more efficient, but we're just starting to generate more of our own power, that's a very different situation than per capita energy consumption is going down significantly. They, they need to understand what the market's doing, not just their own sales. Um, from a cost perspective, they need to understand not only their cost, but what the market is spending on these alternatives. And then they also really need to understand what the customer preferences and market choices are. That's the way that they figure out what's going on in the market. And they're well positioned to do it. They touch pretty much every customer. So if they can get this information, and that helps them figure out where they are, how do they get this information? Um, the question I ask, though, and we'll get to that answer in a second, um, the question I ask is if they've got an effective control stick, right? It doesn't matter a whole lot if you're, you know, if you're going towards the cliff, if you can't actually maneuver out of the way. And I mentioned earlier that they're a regulatory construct. Um, utilities aren't necessarily granted the flexibility to be able to get themselves out of the situation. Um, they are intentionally kept from competing against other entities because they're a natural monopoly. And so when you have a utility try to compete on market services, um, you have the market providers call foul uh, because um, the, there's a certain amount of um, our collectively socializing their balance sheet that gives them a, a leg up. Um, when we competed against, um, we competed for a bid in Ontario for a residential energy efficiency program. And the winner who was selected was Enridge Gas, the gas utility, delivering the program for the energy, the electric utility. It's galling, right? Um, you, you have to give Enbridge credit for being creative and trying to go into the market. You still have to wonder what competitive advantage they have of having a socialized balance sheet that everybody helps maintain. Um, so on the other hand, um, if we expect the utilities to be able to avoid the situation, they do need some leeway. They need some run room. Um, they need some flexibility. They need to be allowed to take risks, possibly earn higher re returns for those risks. Um, and then we, but they also have to make sure that they maintain reliability. So 
the key question, I think, is what are the other revenue streams for utilities to pursue? How are they able to monetize their position in the market in a way that's fair and promotes competition? Um, but at the same time, um, you know, allows them to get through the situation that we're in. And I'm not pretending that I have the answers, but this is certainly the conversation that's taking place. So, so how can utilities get the information that they're looking for, not just on their stuff, but on everybody else's? Um, you can use software to create a marketplace. You can either use a program. So if you're a utility and you start providing rebates for PV systems and battery storage and vehicle chargers and um, energy efficient products, you start picking up information on what everybody's doing. And that information is not valuable just to be able to report to the regulators to get cost recovery and your shareholder incentive. That lets you know what the hell's going on. And so I don't know that utilities are starting to look at that information as, wow, this lets us know where our market's going. Um, those energy savings that we're reporting to the commission is actually the erosion of our market share. What, is that, what does that mean? How do we deal with that? And what can we do to take advantage of that? Um, you know, so you can uh, create a, a system that digitizes the interactions that you have with customers, the people that you meet at the community events, the people who submit applications online, the people requesting new bill service. If you can trace them through a good cus uh, customer relationship management system, you can understand that story and start looking at the data across the board. Um, if you expand your market reach by becoming a marketplace, this is what in New York, what they're calling the Transmission and Distribution Service Provider, the TS TDSPs, that's what they're telling them to become, is to become a market. They want every utility, the goal was for each utility to become a mini independent system operator and to be just a market for individual distributed energy resources. And then the New York ISO would have to manage each of those individual networks. It's complicated. Um, but what it does is it allows them to monetize transactions. So, um, so who here heard of TaskRabbit before they got picked up by IKEA? We got a couple? Okay. So cool concept, right? I need, I need somebody to come in and take care of our, our bathroom. The mirror broke. They took it off. There's mold. It's got to get painted. And, you know, we have three kids. It's just not happening. Um, so I would be able to go online and post a job, and I'd have a few people compete for the job select somebody, bring them in. Hopefully there's like an Angie's review type board. Um, you know, that can happen. Um, there was a case study where um, I want to say, I think it was Con Ed, so Consolidated Edison in New York, created the functional equivalent of TaskRabbit for energy efficiency retrofits. You know, so rather than create an incentive pool and, you know, pay for contractors to go out there, they created the marketplace. Um, Detroit Edison gave a presentation two days ago saying that 76% of their program savings are coming from trade allies. And all they're doing is just making it easier for the, these contractors, the lighting contractors and everybody to do the work. If they start monetizing that, if they start capturing some portion of the revenue associated with that transaction, it's a new revenue stream for them. They're well suited for it. It doesn't mean that they've become a contractor. It just means that they've created a marketplace. Now they're gonna compete with somebody else who might also set that up um, they could hire them to do it, but it's a legitimate use of their role to manage the system. Um, so you can become a marketplace. There are certain third-party providers right now, like Simple Energy is one, um, that um, look to become that. And then finally, how do you use the data from these interactions to quantify changes in the market for you and compare that to where you want it to be? Maybe utility you know, is okay having 50% of the market share. That could be an okay place for them to be, um, but that there might be certain conditions under which that's true. <clears throat> and so how do they figure out what those are? So, um, all right, so let me stop. Um, it, it, we put this narrative together just kind of thinking about it, and I, I liked the article from The Atlantic. Um, let's just get a conversation going for a minute. So what do people think of what I'm talking about? Is it crazy to think that utilities are going to be able to get themselves out of the situation? Should we allow them to get them out of the situation? What do people think? Yes. The first thing that comes to mind is uh, different regulatory constraints that utility has, has. And on the other side, you have the incentives of utility owners, large hedge funds, and Berkshire Hathaway. Are they going to be happy that utilities have to become all these innovative players 
and create another marketplace where they can just keep them uh, milking the cow. Okay. And my other question, is, uh, my other comment is regarding uh, so utilities becoming marketplace. Where would a city-owned utility like Austin Energy uh, standing this becoming a marketplace? So it, okay, those are a lot of really good points and great questions. Um, so taking the first one, which is which are the regulatory constraints, and you know you've got the in, the investor-owned utilities, the shareholders themselves trying to figure out what to do. Um, I think the shareholders are worried right now. Um, you've got, there's a lot of market activity right now. Um, some utilities are worried about stranded assets, the, all the coal plants that are going to end up getting retired more than likely and what they're going to do with those. Um, so I think that the, the shareholders are a little concerned right now. And they, they may be willing to um, start to figure out a way toward a, a new business model. Um, I think there's more distrust among the regulators and the stakeholders of the um, of the interests or the um, the incentives, the incentives towards behavior that the shareholders have, um, they may be less trusting of the way that they think that behavior is going to go, than um, the shareholders are worried about whether they think they're going to have the flexibility. Um, but I so I, I do think that creating that new regulatory regime is going to be pretty important. Um, with regard to the question of the marketplace, like in Austin Energy, it's a it's a challenge because um, there would be nothing stopping Encore from creating an exchange that would also take you know Austin Energy's place. Um, the only thing that Austin Energy might have are the rebates and some other financial incentives that they could offer that only can be provided on their on their marketplace. So um, the utility, because they have the meter. The customer information, the billing information, they do have a, an information network that gives them a leg up over other people. And that would be a way to, but then they'd have to get into the, um, they'd have to get everybody's attention. And then they start competing with the, the awareness on the internet of their marketplace versus everybody else's. Um, yes? I was just gonna say, this is fascinating to me because my prior job was at a research institute and we were helping utilities throughout Texas as they were just starting to grasp and grapple with some of these problems. And a few comments. One, uh, Carl Rabago, who when he used to work at Austin Energy, would often lead off speeches by saying, you realize that paying you a rebate to consume less of my product is not a winning business model. <laughs> <laughs> and, and from a more <laughs> internal perspective, uh, a different <coughs> Texas utility who will remain nameless, mm -hmm. um, the guy from that said, OK, um, he said that 67% of my costs are fixed, and 85 to 90% of my revenues are variable. variable that's water. On PWH <clears throat> consumption. Okay, well, that's, I mean, that's certainly true for the yeah. water utilities yeah, as well. Yeah, it's, right? it's true for both sides. Yep. Uh, and and as, you, yeah. as you start to increase your fixed costs mm -hmm. to deal with that situation, then you disproportionately affect income qualified customers who then can't control their bill, right. which is one of the other reasons you try to make it high on the variable side. Right. There was an, an argument made at one point with regard to some of the solar programs that you, you could argue that the low-income customers are subsidizing the higher-income folks who could afford to put solar on their roofs. I think that's no longer true with some of the new programs that have been rolled out, but that that's argument was at least publicly made. I, I think it had some problems, but it, it was a perception. Okay. The inverse was made um, in, was it San Luis Capistrano in California? There was a case uh, on water where they created, um, so the water utilities <clears throat> used the, incline, the inclining tail block rate to drive a lot of conservation. Sometimes <clears throat> those outer rates are like three, four, ten times higher than the base ones. They were arguing that they were subsidizing everybody else, and that wasn't reflective of the true cost of service. So it went the other way. Yeah, um, yeah. Have you guys ever seen the San Antonio Express News every year? They publish, yes, the shame, they the hall of shame. The shame, hall of shame, like all the rich guys who have like ponds that are leaking and spend like twelve million. Dollars San Antonio water. water is one of our clients, <laughs> and um, we hear a lot of interesting stories about what they're doing. Um, but they've uh, one of the things that they did was they've been working on creating a new. Um, not an ethic, but like a new sense of chic in the residential neighborhoods around um, landscaping. And that's starting to do more to drive conservation and to change that behavior than the shaming that they were, you know, that they were doing. Um, let me keep going here for a little bit. Um, you know, so I, I think that, um, I, so I would take issue with, with Carl. Um, 
I know that that's like heresy, and I'll be shot down in Austin for suggesting such a thing. But uh, I think that there are ways in which that could be their business, um, provided they thought ahead about it, right? That it, you're not going to do that in perpetuity, um, but you might do that to understand who your customer is. And um, you know, I think that it's important to invest in systems that are going to let you know what your customers are doing, what decisions they're making, what they're spending, and what they're, what they're using, and to understand the market share. I mean, there are companies that specialize in gathering data, and then they sell it back to competitors around what the market share is. The utilities should be understanding that themselves, and they're in a position to be able to pay those rebates and then figure out what people spent, and they have a savings estimate, so they figured out what they just lost in market share. So start using that information. So um, one of my favorite examples is DC Water. Um, so George Hawkins became the CEO of DC Water some years ago. He used to be the environmental advocate that was suing DC Water on a regular basis. And they basically they went to him and said, fine, you do it. And he said, fine, I will. Um, and so, so the first thing that he did was um, change the logo because somebody came up to him in one neighborhood um, where one of his trucks were and assumed that they were the, the jail, the penitentiary system, because the logo was indistinguishable from handcuffs, right? They thought, like, they had, like, the, the, the Anacostia River and, like, it looked like two hands and some going up the middle. And so, so they, I mean, they, they spent a ton of time on the logo, um, the, the tagline, um, but when they did that, um, he realized that his competition wasn't PVs, it was bottled water. That's what they were losing market share to. And so he went on a massive campaign to reconnect with the community because like every water utility, the infrastructure is hitting the end of its useful life. Um, he was staring uh, at a capital improvement plan that was going to be raising rates by 5 to 10 percent you know, per year over a certain period of time. And so, um, so this thing over here um, is water from the utility. And they would go out, they'd give people water bottles, and at community events, people could go and fill up there instead of having to buy a bottle of water. They reconnected the product to the community. Um, they started doing other things. Um, their engineers do work uh, in China and help the Chinese build new water and wastewater treatment facilities. They have one of the largest um, composting facilities in North America, um, dealing with uh, the, uh, the sludge left over from the uh, wastewater digestion process. They've created tons of new revenue streams, and he had to get the board to sign off on this. Um, but in doing all this work, he's created multiple revenue streams for them, and he has gotten the public to pass these rate increases. And, and he did it by re-engaging with the community, right? And so it wasn't about, he understood or understood what his market share was being lost to. Um, <clears throat> and it's not that he has significantly suppressed bottled water sales, um, but he got people to start to appreciate the product and they started reconnecting with the customers. And I think that that's a big chunk of what all the utilities need to do right now is to um, stop being invisible and to start being very visible. Um, with the community. So, um, so what can we do? What role do we play in all of this? Um, you know, our vision is to be the platform of choice for what are called utilities of the future. You know, the utilities that are going to make the transition from where we are now to where they're going. Um, that's Raj with the bolt cutters there. So <clears throat> apparently this involves like stealing bicycles, but, um, um, you know, what, what we're doing is, uh, so our core product, the platform, is a salesforce.com approved platform. Um, the name of it on the app exchange is EcoIQ. When it is implemented, it's either Power Path or Waterways. It is a customer relationship management system that has been configured and designed to help utilities run programs that touch their customers. And that can be giving people rebates for their electric vehicle charger, um, giving a business a rebate for converting um, their uh, diesel forklifts to electric forklifts, energy efficiency rebates, um, rainwater harvesting rebates. And the other thing that it does is it captures all the interactions out in the market. So uh, if you 
have an event like this and people sign in and they sign in electronically and they enter their information, they're in the system. That gets connected to their account, their billing information. You now know that they attended. So they attended a workshop of some kind. That means that they are likely, if you do the analytics, to participate in something else. You start bringing the same kind of information together that Amazon is doing on us probably right now and we don't even know it. Um, so, and then the services that we provide are there to help keep the business supporting the platform. Um, we do a lot of work in the water energy nexus. So we're helping a number of energy utilities figure out how to do more work to manage energy consumption of water utilities. Water utilities look at an energy efficiency program and say that's for lighting, that's great, that's 2% of my load, thank you, I have to go get some work done. Um, <clears throat> the energy utilities have to work at getting the water utilities to be there, but as these, not these LED lights, um, but as other LED lights start becoming the market baseline and utilities still have to hit energy efficiency goals, they're not going to be able to count on this anymore. This has been 80% of the program performance, so they're going to have to look for something else. So, and then we've been doing some work in the affordable housing market, um, helping developers appropriately size the utility allowance and making affordable housing a more attractive investment. Um, because the utility allowances that have been set in the market assume very outdated construction standards, given what's actually going on today. So this is what we're doing in the marketplace. The, the goal is for EcoIQ to be, to, to capture that internet of people, right? Um, the rebates that they get, the workshops they go to, the inspections that I do, the storm drain stenciling that, you know, um, all of that is data, and it's data about the customer that the utility can use to gain insight on what's going on in their territory related to their resources and their people. So how do we help people, you know, get you out of the death spiral? By giving you the data, giving you that vantage point so you understand what's going on, um, help the utility navigate the customer base, and then um, conduct these market studies so that we can help them understand um, what's going on. We can use the data in aggregate or we can use data that the utility provides us to help maybe visualize that dashboard for them so they can actually see what's going on. So, um, so we've been around since 2015. It's been just about three years. Um, we are Gaining market traction, um, our most recent client is Marin Clean Energy, which is a community choice aggregator based in California. So they are an alternative uh, to a retailer, Pacific Gas and Electric, outside of the Bay Area. And they offer, um, we're starting with their energy efficiency programs, but they are doing strategic electrification and other services with their customers. And so we hope to grow the use of the platform to engage with their community and, and work with their trade allies. Um, you know, our utility clients have not included Austin Energy and Austin Water. Um, that is something about the city of Austin that I think is a problem and I've been fairly outspoken about that. Um, Austin wants to be an incubator and yet the two flagship utilities that we have don't really seem to want to work with the startups in the community. So if anybody here knows of people there, I hope that you pass that along. I'm not afraid to say it and I'll keep saying it. Um, but so San Antonio has been great. San Antonio Water System has been a very supportive client of ours, uh, CPS. Um, it looks like we're going to start working with. We've worked with Centerpoint, Texas to Mexico Power, Kansas City Power and Light. City of Sunset Valley. City of Sunset Valley is our, was our first. They're the ones who gave us a shot. We will be eternally grateful. Um, and then National Grid, uh, Tucson Water, Flagstaff, and Prescott. Mm -hmm. So we're doing great outside of Austin. Um, so that's, it's just the way the story's been. Um, and then, the, so the team members here, Ian Johnston, Matt Garland, Raj Shah, Megan Bach, and Julian Botto. So um, anyway, I hope this has been interesting for people. Uh, any more questions or discussion? Uh, yes? What is strategic electrification? All right, so um, <clears throat> utilities, one of the utilities' strategies for offsetting revenue loss is to convert the vehicle fleet from gasoline to electricity. Um, or uh, it's fuel switching is what it is, but strategic electrification sounds better because you don't piss off the gas utilities when you say that, <clears throat> even though they know that that's what you're doing. Um, 
So uh, there's a so there's a company called GDS. Um, they're based out of Atlanta. They do have an Austin office, and they do some work. <laughs> they do work with Austin Energy, even though they're not from here. Um, and so, am I bitter? Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> um, so um, they just did a study that showed that um, working with commercial businesses on things like cranes, forklifts, and other diesel-powered vehicles could actually be as, as important as getting um, the, the vehicle fleet converted to electric in terms of the potential it could provide. Could you say that again, please? Sure. So, um, so if you go to uh, a warehouse and, you know, they're probably, they may have um, diesel forklifts, for example. If you look at all of the diesel forklifts in the area and convert them to battery-powered electric ones, um, the electricity revenue boost that you would get from that could be equivalent to significant market penetration in the residential vehicle fleet conversion. You're comparing a warehouse pork truck to everybody's car. So if you look at the market potential, if, if you look at the market potential and the rate of market adoption, so Jacksonville Electric Authority is doing, Jacksonville, Jacksonville is doing this right now. It's a, it's a big push that they have. Um, the implementation contractors ICF usually does energy efficiency, but they're doing this now. Um, they consider it, given the pre given the um, maybe the m maturity of the market and the the um, the infrastructure, right? Because those forklifts aren't going, you know, 200, 300 miles, maybe in a different direction. And then you're not relying upon the, the charging network to also be from place to place. So it's a it's a faster. I think it's a faster grab than trying to convert the residential market. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm struggling with the equivalency of, you know, how many of us here have a pork truck and how many of us here have a car? So I would be happy to take your card and get you a copy of the study. Um, but <clears throat> the conversation that they told me yesterday, and I don't think they were exaggerating, is that is a very significant component of what they can accomplish. Um, the, the point is, I think, that there are many things other than just getting every homeowner to put an electric car in the garage to start offsetting some of the revenue loss. Um, uh, you know, installing heat pump water heaters instead of gas water heaters. The, the electric utilities have a lot of options to them. So that's what the strategic electrification means. In Texas, given the prevalence of wind energy that we have at night, that is a huge decarbonization potential. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's, it's something that I would like to see happen. Sufficient? Please give me your card. I'll, I'll make sure that I follow up with you. Yes? Um, I just want to question one assumption you made at the beginning and mentioned a couple times. It's okay. utilities, fixed costs are remaining stable. Or, or growing. Or growing. Or growing. Yeah, because I, when I talk to people at ERCOT and talk to people at LCRA and others, uh, it costs more to dig a tunnel now than it used to. Yeah, it does, yes. And um, securing things. They wouldn't tell me the, um, the amount their money on security has increased. And it's probably 5 to 10x. Yeah. Our expectations have grown uh, in terms of what we think we should be getting as a product. At the same time, we're trying to kick them in, you know, into the ground um, by finding alternatives. From reliability standpoint, security, um, resiliency, like a lot of these other things. Um, so I didn't, I didn't mean to imply that they were fixed. Um, they're depreciating. They have to get replaced, and then there are, you know, there's increasing performance. Um, I think that people don't sufficiently value the product that they get, um, and that goes back to I think um, engaging with the uh, engaging with the what, with the community. There was a there was another workshop on. Um, diversity and multiculturalism uh, that was taking place. And um, these women from Georgia Power were talking about <clears throat> how the African-American community um, pays their bills by going to the bill payment center. They don't, they don't mail it. They do, don't do it online. The majority of them, especially in the income qualified market, would go to the bill payment center. And when the, um, when the utility um, got acquired, the first thing they did was shut those down because they were trying to reduce costs. So you start losing that connection. And so the, it's, um, it may end up being very short-sighted to lose those connections in order to make it work over the, the long haul. Um, okay. Any, yes? 
Oh, I was just going to ask, have you seen with you know this, this product or with some of your customers, I remember one of the concerns some of the utilities we were working with had was, we would even ask them, okay, how many data points can your brand new, uh, and these were old, but you know, probably would now be considered old, but your smart meters, how many can they connect? 56, 56 data points. How okay. many are they actually connecting? One, kilowatt hours per month. <laughs> and part of the reason for that was that they would be deluged in data and literally could not afford the data storage. So it had, has that become a problem in this new data world? Have you seen that? How do you guys address that? Um, two different ways of answering that. So one is smart meter and then one is, and then the other is us, right? So <clears throat> we are not, and Salesforce is not, Salesforce is definitely not a meter data management platform. Um, there are tools that um, allow you to talk to other data sources. So you don't have to bring it all in, but you've got pointers. Mm -hmm. The ability to visualize, um, Salesforce released something called, um, I think it's, it's either Einstein Analytics or Lightning Connector, one of the two. Um, <clears throat> but what it does is it puts a lens on top of the data and allows you to visualize it and then expunges it. So you're not, you know, so we don't get hammered with the data storage associated with that. Um, the, so the separate issue is what are utilities collecting? And I think it gets back to the notion that they don't know what their dashboard should look like, right? So they think that it's sufficient for them to understand a single data point. Um, there are um, uh, cloud-based providers in the water space that are doing things like creating district meter areas, um, and they are collecting not just flow data, but also pressure data, water hammer data, like a, a much richer network of information so that they can understand what's going on. But still, I think at the home, they're mostly just interested in how much and at what time. Um, the challenge that the water utilities have with the smart meter technology is the battery life because of where the, the meter ends up getting located. And so um, they limit the frequency with which the data gets sent out. So even if it's taking a you know, 10 or 15 minute read, it's only getting sent out once a week um, because that is that transmission that ends up causing a lot of uh, issues with the, the life of the battery. Um, so I haven't heard a lot about data storage costs there's another company here called Fathom. Um, they're headquartered in Arizona, but they have a big presence here. They would be an interesting entity to get in here, I think, and to give a presentation about. Have you talked to Jason Bethke? And no. They would be, so they are a, um, they're an interesting story. So there, was a, so there was a Texas community that put in place the Fathom platform, and they got a 17% reduction in consumption and a 6% increase in revenue. And that's because the meters are bad in the water space. And so the apparent losses, the loss of revenue is pretty significant. So just by correcting the meters, they were able to get that boost in revenue even as they achieved water conservation savings in the drought stage. So you have a question? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. So I um, met somebody from a company called Energy, which is based in Germany. It's a, um, they're getting very heavy into the distributed energy resource market, and they just created a, an office in Boston. So I guess they're trying to figure out <clears throat> how to work their way into the market. I think that the, the European market, Germany in particular, has been dealing with this death spiral issue longer than anybody. They're kind of seen as the canary in the coal mine, as it were. Um, about what happens when renewable costs start coming down and the utility costs start going up significantly if you get a high enough penetration of it. Um, so if you have an under, so I don't know that much about the South African electricity market. I don't know anything about the South African electricity market. Um, is it still, um, is it uh, a public entity or is it privatized? It's still public monopoly. Okay. Okay, okay. 
Um, so uh, first energy um, in the U.S. is a lot like that. Um, from a I, <laughs> from a from a philosophical and even theological perspective, I think that that's the way <clears throat> that's the way that they viewed it as well. Um, they. Um, but they ended up um, having to go to the regulators to bail them out because of the coal plants that they had to retire. Um, so some of it may have been, you know, um, the philosophy and other other parts of it may have been um, practical, you know, business um, perspective. So if you've got a state-run agency that has that kind of a um, perspective on things, then um, <laughs> Usually, it's destabilization that causes change in that kind of environment. And so, trying to, unless you've got um, individual champions within the organization who are willing to take some risks to be able to move things along, and they're going to have political backing from ministries or uh, other people that can try to protect their job and their position, it's a, it's a, that's going to be a tough sell. Um, you know, the the privatization of the market doesn't fix things necessarily. Um, in New York, for example, they're trying to figure out how to reward the utilities for um, kind of a multivariate set of metrics, right? So efficiency, carbon, reliability, and then the return on equity is key to performance in each one of those areas as opposed to just 10% on capital. Um, so you can take a look at, so the, the docket in New York is called Renewing the Energy Vision, or REV, REV. Um, you could look at that and see, you know, what they've been doing, but that's been like eight years in the making and the political backers behind it have left the commission. So I don't, it's just, that's a long, that's a 20 to 40 year process that you're talking about. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody on the side of the room? Okay. How prevalent uh, is um, Salesforce in the utilities? And then Not very. Um, so, a, yep. so if, I, if somebody wants to adopt your platform, they need to adopt Salesforce. So no, not, not necessarily. So, um, so there are two different flavors of being a um, Salesforce entity. So one is called OEM which means that you can just buy it direct from us. And even though we're using Salesforce kind of as our programming language, um, you don't have to enter into a contract with Salesforce specifically. It's just, it's just through us. Um, if a utility gets a Salesforce instance, then we can also be added as an app. They have a whole app store with GIS and all these other kinds of things. Um, what we are finding, so the, the energy efficiency space in particular is starting to get more comfortable with Salesforce because of the certifications, security, and scale that they're able to provide. Um, we're able to consistently demonstrate that we're meeting the requirements that the utilities have established. And so I think that you've got some early adopter or some, you know, uh, Energy Orbit is a company that was, I think, the pioneer of the use of Salesforce and energy efficiency. Um, and we are riding on their coattails a little bit um, in terms of what they've managed to accomplish over the past 10 years. But other companies are starting to adopt Salesforce as their standard platform. The utilities are getting more familiar with it. But again, because of this OEM model, a utility doesn't have to get a contract with Salesforce. It's, it's our programming language is effectively what it is. Does that answer your question? OK. Um, Owen. Uh, it seems to me that one of the better arguments that the uh, utilities can make to keep the uh, social contract viable for them in the future so their costs are socialized and that the public even be willing to subsidize their R&D mm -hmm. is that more extreme weather events are going to keep happening and that they're the, the ones who have the demonstrated expertise in keeping the, the lights on and the clean water running and that because we can expect good, good reasons to think the actuarial algorithms would point to yet more extreme events happening another Hurricane Harvey happening sooner rather than later, this year, next year, what have you. Therefore, they can say, hey, keep, keep giving us the money. We'll keep everything going through the, the, the crazy future. Mm -hmm. I don't hear them making that argument, but it seems to me that it would be rational for them to do so. It would be. They'd, ha they'd have to admit a uh, reality that not everybody politically is willing to admit at this stage. 
It's a very divisive topic <laughs> you bring you guys. That not everybody's on the same page on that one. Like they, I, I mean, they make, I mean, they may, so they may agree with you, but they may be reluctant to actually vocalize that um, because of the political base that they're working with and whether that group wants to even believe that there are the increasing events that you're describing. I mean, you could, they could be agnostic about why those events are happening. But they maybe, could. But maybe <laughs> right. point to the ones that are happening and say, they, well, we have no idea could, why I, this is happening. So the, um, the, uh, you have the data, but... No, yeah. no, no. The, so we, I saw the state meteorologist um, gave a presentation having finished the analysis of the Harvey events and that, you know, he is showing um, the, the increase of the frequency of, you know, the events that you're, you're describing. The... Um, I think that you've got something because um, like a solar city, for example, <clears throat> I don't think is positioned to within a week's time um, replace everybody's <coughs> solar panels, right. you know, five million, six million people in order to make sure the power gets restored. Um, and so that does that does create an interesting fallback. Now, if I were a utility, you know, I might be interested in um, charging a customer a um, an insurance, kind of like a service line insurance agreement, but for the solar panel. So in the event of that kind of event, the utility would um, work with Solar City to make sure that they marshaled their resources together for that kind of response. Um, and that might be a surplus or a premium product that they could offer. So um, that's interesting. And no, I haven't heard anybody uh, talk about it that way. I should mention the communication aspect of what was the Florida thing that you were pushing SMS capabilities. Yeah, just being able to do text advisories, uh, water boil notices. I mean, you know, the a lot of the utilities, um, it's not funny, I'm sorry, but the um, it wasn't, uh, not Harvey, um, sorry, the one that hit Florida, like, you know, thank you. Um, the So it knocked out all the power and it knocked out the water system, but the only place that people could go to get information on um, whether the water was safe to drink was on the website for the utility as the power was down, right? So the being able to have text capability, um, you know, that kind of notification, that kind of GIS network to get the right information out to the right connected system is something that the utilities could, should be doing. That's an app on Salesforce, right? So there's, there's a lot of added functionality that we're trying to communicate is out there in order to try to um, <clears throat> make people aware that the systems are, are available. Charlie. I was going to ask if you've um, had, if you've seen more traction with like uh, co-ops or other uh, kind of entities that are more, uh, I guess, uh, membership based, which is not the proper. Uh, so, um, so I think that um, a number of those entities have already started with their own system. Like our biggest competition is the internal IT department. I mean, that just, it is true. Um, the, the number one thing we run into is IT saying we can do that and that effectively kills the conversation for two years until nothing happens and they're ready to talk again. Um, but the, um, the co-ops have put certain kinds of systems or platforms in place and then you've got um, organizations like, um, is it Touchstone? There's, a, there's like a really big um, kind of national entity that helps co-ops by providing certain kinds of member services, including maybe yeah. certain types of platforms. Um, the most traction that we've had are with utilities that are um, really frustrated with the legacy systems, multiple spreadsheets, multiple access databases, um, <clears throat> and are investing a significant amount of labor, um, but have the backing of the department to want the customer experience to be better. Um, and, you know, those are few and far between. We've gotten good at, like, um, if we bump into a water utility, we go and we take a look at the business card and look them up on the LinkedIn profile, right? If there's no photo, if there's no information about the work history, it's just, like, the name, the gray blob, and, like, the degree, we move on. Because we know that, like, a digital footprint is just not something that that company is going to be interested in. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's stuff that you just pick up over time. <laughs> Criteria. The great it, <laughs> that and an AOL email address. Yes, <laughs> there, there are actually um, there there are a good there are a good number of those still. Yes. All right. 
So um, I appreciated the discussion and the questions. Um, I owe you, now I'm interested, so now I have to get you an answer. Um, so I'll, I'll try to track down the information from GDS. Please give me your business card. Um, but it's 8 o'clock, and so um, I thank everybody for your attention for being here tonight.